Peter Hartman with Renewable Now and RNN, and I am happy to be at Rhode Island College with the Environmental Council of Rhode Island. We are here to talk about green energy and green spaces. We're talking about siting renewables, an issue that can be local, but certainly an issue that has become very national and very international. Most of us would think, hey, that's pretty easy, right? We're going to kind of go where the wind is blowing and we're going to go where the sun is shining. But obviously, right, no, life gets a lot more complicated as we will see tonight as we talk to a great panel and as we go through the presentations that will take us through all the different issues around permitting and, and all of the issues that are so complicated. Um, one of the things, though, I want to talk about real quick is, is this is really how, how the Environmental Council of Rhode Island has framed it. They talked about, as part of the global move away from conventional centralized electricity generation towards a new form of energy, Rhode Island has set goals for the Department of Renewable Energy, and, and these likely will become more ambitious in coming decades. But with limits in the amount of solar that can be deployed on the roofs of Rhode Island buildings, wind turbines, and solar arrays, we will inevitably be erected in the fields, in the forest, and in the waters. So where should wind and solar projects be cited? What factors should be considered? What limits should be set on where wind and solar projects will be built? And what are the rights of landowners and citizens? So to help us sort through that is my co-host today, Ken Filarski. Ken, come on in. Good to see you again. Welcome to Rhode Island College. Well, Peter, thank you for having me. Good to be with you. Great to be, of course, with a, a live audience. And Ken, why don't we start by, I know you want to acknowledge a couple people have done a great job of pulling all of this together, and then we're going to give an overview of our discussion tonight. Terrific. I just, I, I would like to preface this by saying that um, I've had the wonderful opportunity to be involved with a lot of national audiences, either in, in person or with national conference calls. And one of the things that people in Rhode Island don't realize is, is how not only how fondly, but how people look on Rhode Island, the accomplishments, not only in energy, but in terms of in, also environment, for, for what we've done. A lot of times people think that Rhode Island is, is ahead of the game um, and actually at the, at the cutting edge with uh, sort of Resilient Rhode Island Act of 2014, Coastal Resources Management Council, and their SAMP projects, uh, the energy efficiency programs and whatnot. And, and so uh, with that as a preface, what I'd, what I'd just like to do is, is Bring to bear. You mentioned the Environmental Council of Rhode Island, but also one of the things that we could do in Rhode Island is that we can come together very quickly. And so ECRI had this idea several months ago. The policy co uh, committee of, of ECRI brought it together. And Jerry Elmer is the president of ECRI. Uh, with the policy committee, we have Meg Kerr, Kat Burnham, Christian Rosalind, Greg Garrett, and Priscilla Dela Cruz. And with that, they reached out to Renewable Now, and then we reached out to the Sustainability Office of Rhode Island College. And I know there was a lot more work going on that people knew, can see, but it's, it's an example of how we can come together for a common purpose. Yeah, and we're at a great place, right? This is, and Jim Murphy is going to be addressing the crowd in a second from Rhode Island College. This is a green ribbon school, great place to be. So tell us very quickly, because it's interesting. I, I saw one quote that really stuck out for me. I was preparing for today. It said this, it said, solar power is not about fashion. It is about survival. And so as you think about tonight and the issues that we will address and then the potential solutions, um, and being here at the heartbed of one of the education centers, one of the meccas in Rhode Island, right, it all kind of, as you said, comes together around, around the seriousness of these issues as well. It sure does. I was asked to give a pithy quote for, for today, and, and my pithy quote was essentially come down to uh, renewable energy is becoming mainstream. But uh, what's happening now is that there's, uh, well, I'll just say this, large-scale renewable energy projects can be well done with careful thought or they can become the ubiquitous equivalent of the big box stores, plopped here and there because they can and because it's easy. We're not in energy's wild west. We're in thoughtful New England, and we ought to take advantage of that. And we are going to see that. Give us a minute. We'll be right back. They told me a bottle couldn't dream. That I would never 
become a superhero. But I learned how to fly just to come back in a new disguise and be the hero that I've always wanted to be. There are two panels today. The first panel will be dealing with current practices and current issues. And on the panel, we have Brian Wagner from the town of Coventry, Doug Doe from the West Bay Land Trust, Paul Raduca from Providence Energy Group, and Diana Kushner of the Ar Arcadian Fields Organic Farms. So we're just going to get right into it. I think we'll start with uh, Brian. Uh, good evening. Um, I am an associate planner with the town of Coventry. Um, I began working there at the beginning of the year, and little did I know that I was uh, parachuting into a bit of a renewable uh, controversy. Uh, for any of you who have not uh, been in Coventry recently, a lot of this stems from uh, the construction of a number of wind turbines uh, a few years ago in 2014. Uh, we had a developer come in and put up 10 1.5 megawatt um, wind turbines. Uh, if you listen to members of the community, they sprang up overnight with virtually no warning uh, with claims of uh, government corruption. If you listen to the government, nobody showed up at the public hearings to give comment on the wind turbines. Uh, whichever view you happen to um, agree with, uh, they have created a lot of friction, a lot of suspicion with respect to renewable energy development um, in the town of Coventry. Uh, in addition, th there have been uh, problems with complaints about the aesthetics, light flicker, and noise from the turbines. Uh, so that sort of poisoned the atmosphere in town when it comes to renewables. Um, our first large solar project uh, was applied for in the summer of 2016. It was going to be 20 acres of um, clearing on a 40-acre site in western Coventry, uh, primarily wooded lot. Um, and that was heard and reviewed and um, denied by the Town Planning Commission at the first uh, stage of approval. Um, the, the types of um, the basis for the decision um, focused on the extensive clear cutting of the area, and that, in fact, is the primary concern of the people in Western Coventry. If you listen to them, they moved to Coventry because of the rural lifestyle. They wanted to stay that way. Uh, they interpret our town comprehensive plan to prohibit commercial development in the rural residential uh, areas of the community out at Route 102 and uh, west. Uh, and they are battling um, very hard to keep it that way. Uh, we currently have two more large commercial scale solar projects uh, in the queue. Uh, one at a one megawatt size, uh, fairly small, another at much larger at five megawatts. Um, and it's the same opposition that we're, we're hearing again. Um, you know, why are we cutting down trees? Why can't we locate these in developed areas? We have a landfill that would suffice uh, we have several Superfund sites that could be used, yet all people seem to want to do is cut down the forest. And that's um, effectively the attitude that I'm seeing on the western half of the state. So as a planner, I now have to try and balance, you know, how we can somehow address their desire to develop their community in the, in the way they like with also moving forward with legitimate development opportunities. Uh, Brian, you're also an attorney, are you not? Yes. Okay. I did, I, no, no feeling one way or the other on that. I, just, I, I think it's important to know that besides being a planner, you also have a, a legal context to the way you're looking at things. And since you mentioned opposition and, and then cutting down of trees, um, someone might think that it's, it's counterintuitive to, to put a solar farm to 
uh, in, lieu of, in lieu of where there is woodland and trees. And I think that uh, with that in mind, Doug Doe from the West Bay Land Trust in Cranston um, might be able to expand on that. Well, good evening. Um, my talk's in three parts. First, the emergence of solar power is an issue in Cranston. Uh, second, the design and the impact of a 21 and a half megawatt utility scale project in my neighborhood of Lippitt Avenue. And third, my recommendations for other communities. I learned of the issue September 17th, 2015, when the city councilman sent me an email saying the council was considering a proposal to allow a solar power project in Hope Road Cornfield. The West Bay Land Trust had been working with DEM to protect the 76 acre farm, including meeting with the family to tour the farm which was adjacent to 222 acres of conservation land and on the historic farm route that was formed in 2004. At the time, I was chair of the Conservation Commission. The planning department had prepared an ordinance to update the zoning schedule of use chart, explaining a statement, quote, changes to uses that reflect changes to technology, alternative energy, and solar power. And this was part of a whole grab bag of changes to schedule of use. That was the entire written explanation for solar power provided by the planning department and the planning commission. The ordinance would allow solar power by right in Western Cranston's two acre zoning district. The council approved the zoning change without any underlying solar ordinance. I was told by a member of the planning department that why do we need one because quote, they're just panels and wires. I worked with Councilman Steve Stikos to prepare a minimal ordinance that is based on Dartmouth's mass ordinance and regulations in effect in Ontario, Canada. The council accepted the ordinance after the Hope Road developers agreed to its conditions. The ordinance covers site preparation, lighting, noise, decommissioning, and abandonment. The city council approved the solar power amendment to the comprehensive plan uh, this year. This is a separate issue, which was rejected by the Division of Statewide Planning for technical reasons. The amendment classifies solar power development as a land preservation tool listed with conservation easements, the purchase of development rights, and conservation subdivisions. Because, officials claim, the solar projects would temporarily remove the land's development potential. State officials did not agree with the notion that solar power projects were not development. Um, the ordinance's failure to require vegetative buffers has had a devastating impact on the night farm conservation land in my neighborhood. The 21 and a half megawatt project built on a 60 acre clear cut shares an 1800 foot border with the conservation land. The ongoing destruction goes right up to the farm's stone wall. You can see the impact on Flickr.com. I've been posting photos and videos. If you want to see them, just search for, search for Lippet Solar. And for the record, I'm going to butter to the access road for the project. Um, if you ever hear the words phase construction associated with solar projects, please be aware that does not include clear cutting. Um, as far as recommendations for going forward on our primarily large utility scale projects, like five megawatts or greater, to begin with the process, maintain an open and transparent process from, all, from, from the beginning. Engage all stakeholders, developers, property owners, farmers, conservation commission, land trusts, and any interested member of the public. Reach out to them. Look to Cumberland, uh, South Kingstown, and Charlestown, and outside Rhode Island for solutions and policies. Um, go to public hearings, even if you know you're going to lose. Use the opportunity to raise awareness for issues you think are important. Maybe someone will listen to you. Uh, for project issues, require site visits by public officials. Get out from behind computers and desks. Go to the site, open your eyes, walk the land. There was no substitute. Our planning director decided there was a 50-foot vegetated buffer on the hayfield because he saw it on his GIS map on the computer, not because he went out there and looked at it. Um, require special permits for projects in residential zones and utility scale projects. Do not assume utility scale projects will disappear in 25 years, returning the farmland back to production. Do not provide financial incentives for projects proposed on undeveloped forest or farmland. Do not allow facilities on prime farmland. If you can't do this, they restrict development to no more than 10 buildable acres. Require dual use for, on farmlands so land remains productive. This is common throughout the world. It's not unique. Value undeveloped forests, forests as much as wetlands. Restrict clear cutting of woodlands. Require a minimum 50 foot setback abutting conservation land. 100 feet's better. 
and do not allow clear cutting within the setback. They're using the setback on the 21 megawatt project as the road. So they went right to the edge. Um, interconnection records for utility scale projects from, for the national grid should be public records. And a butter should be notified when the application is filed so they know what's going on. They don't find out about it six or 10 months later. Trying to get information on national grid is impossible as far as interconnection goes. And finally, please, whatever you do, do not follow the Cranston model because you'll end up down the rabbit hole. Or a 60 acre clear cut, scraped clean of all vegetation and covered with 50,000 solar panels surrounded by a chain link fence is land preservation, not development. Rhode Island deserves better. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Doug. The, um, you certainly touched on a lot. One of the things that Doug did not mention, and I, may, I might bring up uh, for further discussion later on, is that, as you heard from Doug, the city of Cranston twists them inside out to, do, to set up the legal um, municipal infrastructure to allow the solar farm. Yet, what happened is, that this, is this is nothing against the developer uh, whatsoever, but the benefit of that is the city of Providence because in the in agreement that the city of Providence made with the developer of that particular uh, mm -hmm. situation is that the city of Providence will be garnering somewhere at eight to nine hundred thousand dollars a year in energy savings. So you have to start scratching your head and start wondering, well, you know, what's going on here? If the city is going to turn themselves out inside out to, to make this happen, maybe there should be some benefit to ta you know, the taxpayers. I'm not saying it should, but it, it's a question. And, um, and since the, uh, the, we've heard sort of the municipal side and the land trust side of these developments, and obviously developers involved, Paul, uh, why don't you uh, speak to what you see as are the issues and questions and, and problems that, that you face? Absolutely. Um, my name is Paul Raduca. I, um, my background, I'm actually a CPA by trade, so don't hold that against me. But in 2002, after 9-11, um, I ended up hiking the Appalachian Trail through hiking it to kind of combine some of my environmental leanings to my career and embarked on getting involved in renewable energy. I, I view it as, you said, a, a vehicle of for the environment, but it's also a, it, it's also a financial hedge on, on future energy prices. Um, and to Peter's point, my first boss made a statement to me once, and it becomes more and clear every year I work, and, that he's, and it's a copy from someone else, and he said, to every complex issue, there's usually a simple answer, and it tends to be wrong. And I, and I find that every day when I work. Um, so, you know, we're trying to, to, to balance these obligations that our state is trying to meet and also our fiduciary, fiduciary responsibilities to the environment. Um, and what I want to do is put you guys in the place of what I see as a developer as we go looking at projects and what are the pain points and what may be causing some of the pain points across the board to other stakeholders. And there's seven factors that, that make a project. It's the site. And it's the, the, the characteristics of the sites, be it the top of the wetlands, the flood zone, obstructions along that side. There's the interconnection, which is the most, one of the key factors that is a, a very costly factor. And that process takes anywhere be, between three to six months and can cost upwards to twenty to $30,000. Um, you need a zoning approval. You also need an off taker who's going to buy the energy. And then you also need a program in place that you're going to be able to slot this project in based on the size on there. And you also need financing. And a lot of these things are like trying to land, a, land several planes at the same time because financing won't come in unless you have an off taker in some cases. And the off takers won't sign up with you unless you actually have a project site that needs to be developed. So it gets pretty complex very, very quickly. And one of the factors that plays into that is, is some of the ordinances in the towns. And a lot of the towns have, have put their ordinances in. In some cases, it's a, first, it's a first shot, and there's flaws in them. But one of the key things is that when there's not a clear path on how a project can be developed, it adds cost to the overall project and to the overall program when there's not a clear path that someone if there's rules to the road or they're, they're, they're a moving target. Um, case in point, I heard something today where uh, a developer was looking at developing a project in a town. They ended up proceeding down that path 
got an award for the, the actual program, which National Grid requires you to put a $75,000 deposit in addition to the amount of uh, development costs that you've incurred, which is $30,000 for the, uh, the interconnection application to find out whether you actually can connect it, and then the additional development process to only find out the town didn't allow it. Now, my view is they took several risks, but they basically left about $150,000 on the table, which they need to recoup. And that's something as developers we hit all the time. So having a town that has a clear path of here's the rules of the road makes everything move a lot smoother from a developer standpoint versus some of the towns that are in flux. Um, we've been focusing, I work with Kearsarge Energy um, also, um, and we are working on three Superfund sites in Rhode Island. Um, I've had an initiative to work on, on brownfields myself on a, a large scale 22 megawatt project down in, in New Jersey on a very large landfill. And um, I see that as a very, uh, a very good source of, of where to put projects, but there's complexities on that um, of how you can actually um, do that, whether it's a landfill or a brownfield. These are actually where our landfills, the Superfund sites. Um, they cost more from several standpoints on the development process and also in the deployment of the actual rack. And, and on a landfill, that's a Superfund site that is capped. Most ground mounts, like the one you're referring to, is driving pilings in and they're putting five panels up in a landscape uh, uh, picture. While on a, land, on, a, on a capped landfill, you have to use ballast. You can only go two panels up and your degrees are only 20 degrees versus 25 to 30 degrees where you get more output because of the wind load on the cap. So it costs about, there's five times more racking to be done on a, on a landfill than there is on a regular post um, piece. It translates into labor, into output, and translates right through the whole economic model of the project. But it still is viable. We're able to make it work, and I think there are ways that we can actually start moving towards that way, as other other uh, states have. Um, brownfields, too, are, are another classification within the landfills that are, are 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 doable, but have some of the same inherent issues that you see on there. Uh, people have mentioned also rooftops and and uh, canopies on parking lots and. There's additional costs and complexities on those, um, specifically to the roofs. On small scale, it works very good if it's the owner of the building, owns the business in the building, and he's all invested in it. When you look at larger buildings where a third party owns the building and someone else is in there, to balance that lease payment of what happens when the roof has to be replaced, does it have to get maintenance, is the revenue enough for this big company to jeopardize their roof for, some, for a revenue stream? I had a large project down in, in Baltimore and the lease negotiations took six months and never went forward. Um, you know, so that's some of the things that we, we, go, we go through on those, the alternatives, but I do see you know, brownfields and other sites. And I think as you see in Massachusetts, and I think that's gonna be coming up, the discussion on is that you can create the incentives and incentives to drive where these projects go. You know, right now, the way the program works, everyone's looking for the lowest cost because the PUC and the rate holders, which rate payers, which are us in the room here, want the lowest cost energy. So that's driving projects to become the lowest cost. So we're all looking basically for the soccer field next to a substation. Um, you know, and, and that's what you're seeing happening in, in, the, in these sites on um, there. Um, and you know, there's inherent value. I think one of the things that's it's hard to, to see is the inherent value of land is different from everybody's eyes in here. Uh, you know, one person sees a solar farm, one person sees a soccer soccer field, someone sees a hay field. It's all different. How do we actually capture that within the program um, and our incentives? And I think you know, it can be done. Rhode Island really embarked on a very good program. Um, that has been very successful. I think we need to go into the next phase of honing this thing down a little bit more. Thank you, Paul. I think what we're starting to hear and see is a developing pattern where you notice that everybody up here does not represent an, an urban situation. 
um, is, is basically uh, suburban, rural, semi-rural, semi which goes to the path of least resistance. Now we've, we've talked to, uh, heard from the municipal official, a neighbor, a, a neighbor of, of a property that's being developed um, uh, in part of a, a land trust, a developer, but what it all comes down to is really the land in, in many respects. And, and so right now, um, uh, Diana, it's all yours. All right, hey everyone. I'm a farmer. My name is Diana Kushner, and I have a farm in Hope Valley, Rhode Island. It's called Arcadian Fields Organic Farm. I've got lots of notes here. Probably going to use any of them. Um, but anyways, on the way over here today, um, there is a car in front of us, and my husband was like, wow, Maine has really neat license plates. And I looked at it, and it was like this little farm scene, and underneath it said, um, support local agriculture. And I was like, well, that's great. I was thinking about people growing food like that farm scene, and then I thought, oh, well, other people have other ideas of what it might be to support local agriculture, and maybe that's paying all these farmers a bunch of money and paving their fields with solar panels. Um, so it really made me think, what is supporting local agriculture? So I was asked to come here tonight. Um, we are a farm, and we have solar panels on one of our roofs. And it's great. We got lots of subsidies and grants and tax rebates and everything. And I can tell you more about that in a bit. But I thought, um, I want to tell you more about maybe how it What's going on in the farming community with how we see solar panels on fields? And I know there's really two different, um, two different segments of the community. Um, and I'm, I'm a farmer who wants to grow food for people. Um, I see the soil as something that's irreplaceable and really important. Recently, down the road from us, there was a farm that's do past tense. I don't know what they're going to do now. But bulldozers were there, and they swept all the topsoil away. They paved it, and they're putting up solar panels. And to me, this is no different of an impact on the land than if they just put up a shopping mall. It's no different. And I know I hear people saying, oh, we can just put the soil back. But what is soil? Do they have any idea? You can't just put soil back. I mean. I mean, you can hear the statistics. Every teaspoon has a billion living organisms. So it kind of makes me sick to think about the idea of our farm fields being paved over in this way. Others would go, great, you know, my farm's doing really poorly. I could really use this money. Um, but I think there's a better. I think there's a better way to support farmers who are doing poorly than just to give them money to have solar panels put up. Um, so. Back to my notes here. There's got to be something important um, besides telling you about our solar um, system. Excuse me here. Everyone else here is used to speaking publicly, I guess. Um, you're doing just. You're doing just fine. Okay. So. Here's, here's one other thing I want to mention. So there's a group in Rhode Island called the Rhode Island Food Policy Council. And maybe they're having a meeting tonight in some other building. And they have this really great idea that by the year 2060, Rhode Island will be producing 50% of its own food. And so, and I think that's a really amazing goal. And I don't think 20 years ago when I started my farm, they would have had that goal. Since the past 20 years has happened, there's been so much so much growth in the local food, food movement here in Rhode Island. But I think about that goal, and then I think about all this money that's being offered to farmers. And I know all these old time swamp Yankees in Hope Valley, and they're always coming up to me like, oh, solar farm people came over and talked to me. I think I'm going to sell my land. And they keep saying that. They haven't done it yet, because I know these guys also really love their land. But one day, they're going to do it. And that land's going to be gone. And it makes me think about the um, Rhode Island Food Policy Council. and they might as well throw out this goal. And so I look at it, like we've got these two different things going on here. And citing solar energy or sol citing solar wind power, and then just having enough food for the people on this planet to eat. And I guess I want to put out there as an organic farmer that 
saving the soil is really preeminent. We all need to eat. That need isn't going to go away. With more and more people, it's going to be more important for Rhode Island to consider um, the small amount of agricultural land it has. So back to our solar system. 2015, we decided we needed solar panels, mainly because our furnace died. And we're like, well, maybe we could get an electric furnace. Well, if we're going to do that, we need solar panels. So we worked with a company, and they were totally awesome. They walked us through everything. Within six months, we had panels on our roof. We haven't paid a single electric bill since. And I tell this to all my old-time swamp Yankee farmers. Like, you want to make a good investment. Put solar panels on your roof. In eight years, it'll pay for itself. In 25 years, um, we would have made a $25,000 profit. By then, I'll be 70. This is going to be really awesome. I'm not going to have to pay anything you know, for the rest of my life. So um, yeah, if you have any questions about soil, farming, farmers, whatever, just ask. Uh, Diana, could I, a quick question here. How, how big is your farm? Um, good question. And I think this gets to it. My farm is 25 acres. Um, so suppose I could develop 20% of it for solar energy. That would include about all of my open fields. So I've got 25 acres, but three acres that are flat for growing. And if someone came and wanted to develop my farm for a solar array, they would choose the three best acres I have. They wouldn't choose the hilly stuff. They wouldn't choose the marginal stuff on the sides that's being shaded by trees. They would take my best acres. And so in fact, when we had a choice of where we wanted to put our solar array, it was obvious. It was going to go on the roof because we didn't want to lose any of our land whatsoever. And there's this idea, well, maybe you could just put it on the grass and not do anything. And I'm sure as a developer, you know, no, that's not going to happen. You can't get sheep to go under it. Anyone who's ever had a sheep know they're really picky eaters. Like trying to maintain land under a solar panel, it's just, you know, that'd be great. I'm sure someone's working on it and, you know, maybe we can get some grant money to figure that one out. <laughs> Well, I think we all can see there's a little bit of a conundrum going on here. Um, does anybody in the audience have any reaction, questions, thoughts? And I'll, um, I'll go over with the, uh, okay. the mic. And because this is being televised or recorded, just be energetic. <laughs> Not like me. <laughs> uh, first off, thank you for all of your perspectives. Very interesting and informative. Uh, just came from the interesting sighting panel at OER, and we ended that conversation with talking about how climate change is happening. We need emission-free sources to be here in Rhode Island. How do we, you know, strategically put up solar and other green energy projects in Rhode Island? My big concern is if we limit renewables, we might make it easier for fossil fuels to go up in this state. So how do we be careful that we don't limit renewables so much that we make it easier for, say, new natural gas to come into Rhode Island? Thanks. Anybody on the panel want to take a shot at that? Get everyone to put something on their roof. It's really great. It's an easy process. If um, since we've done it, my parents have done it, their neighbors have done it, I've had a few friends on farms who've done it, and everyone is really happy. So spread the word, put the panels on your roof, just do it. Paul, you had your hand up? Yeah, I mean, and that makes sense. I mean, I have solar on my roof. Um, it was an initiative I, I pushed on. One of the things that goes back to is they're pushing on the lower cost. When you look at installing on a roof, it's significantly more expensive than actually when you see the larger projects. So there's a balance between the cost overall that the ratepayers have to have to to take on versus the the uh, you know of the different structures on that um, you know so it is it's a really tough balance you don't want to lose farmland you don't want to be taking on there there are sites and and I feel looking at at projects we've done some projects in Colorado where we've actually done um, uh, uh, beehives are actually integrated within the actual solar panel um, groupings and trying to see how you can actually integrate any kind of farming or stuff in there. It is tough. The solar panels cover that up. There's a good story in Germany. They thought they would put goats there to minimize the, um, the plants um, so they wouldn't have to mow it, and they ate all the wires off the solar panels. <laughs> the, one of the, what, what people always talk about rooftops uh, driving into urban areas. But it's difficult because there are setbacks from the edges of the roofs. You have mechanical equipment up there where you have to have setbacks. Um, you have to have the proper structure. You have to have a new roof. 
Um, so those are, those are some of the, the things on the other side. Christian? Uh, yeah, I just, I just wanted to um, put some technical, I'm Christian Rosalind, I, I helped organize this. Um, I write about solar energy for a living. I wanted to put some technical perspective here to rooftop solar. Uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratories, which is a project of the Department of Energy, put out a study on the technical potential of rooftops. And Rhode Island has some of the best potential to meet power demand with rooftop solar. But that technical demand, uh, potential is either 57 or 59 percent of in-state power usage. And if you know anything about technical potential, can you mention that there are setbacks? I believe there's a four-foot setback uh, for the fire code. So that's a lot of real estate gone right there. And then the fact of the matter is technical potential is never anywhere near reached because people who have older roofs are not going to put a 30-year investment on an old falling apart roof. So there are significant limits to the amount of electricity that we're going to be able to get from rooftop solar under the most ambitious, successful scenarios for deployment. Can we have a question here? Uh, more of a comment. Um, first of all, uh, about the siting situation, um, there's no one simple answer, obviously. But uh, every time I'm driving around and every time I stop somewhere, uh, there are parking lots all over the place. And I think that every single large parking lot uh, in, the, in Rhode Island and elsewhere should be covered with uh, photovoltaic arrays. And this is something that uh, not only, you know, I don't think people would resist, they love it because they, they get, uh, you know, shade for their cars. Uh, but the second thing is that uh, solar is not just electricity. And the other, the other factor is that we need to be innovative, we need to be brave and go forward with new things. As many of you know, I have to say it, I'm married to a brilliant solar inventor here. He has a lot of things that uh, at least should be looked at. And he and other people like him. And that's, that's two things that uh, would, I think, help. Thank you very much. We have, we have a question back here, I think, believe. Ken, I don't know if anybody wanted to uh, address that yes. last could, comment. Yeah, um, parking lots, I agree with you. That's one area, and, and I have been involved in some parking lot. Um, canopy insulations, you know, in, in this, I'm going to go right back to my other statement. It's cost on, on the project to, 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 to basically make those economics work. It's very hard to make those work um, under the programs that we have. Um, there's significant cost factors on there, and there's also significant uh, installation um, issues you have in actually going into a, a, an active parking lot. Um, if you went to Walmart and said, hey, we're going to have these guys working in your parking lot, you'd have to either, you know, obviously phasing it is one way, but that does create more cost of how do you interrupt putting poles into the actual, um, uh, poles into the actual uh, pavement and the liability in there, there's a lot of factors that go in. It is very feasible. It's being done in Massachusetts. Um, it's being driven by incentives on there. there, there you create incentives and de-incentives to do that. But it is a very um, costly uh, uh, proposition um, in general. But it is a good solution. Peter is walking the microphone to another query. Uh, just sort of a follow-up question there. Um, I guess when I was envisioning the parking lots, I was thinking about the fact that if we're going to be fighting climate change, we need to be um, decommissioning uh, car infrastructure everywhere. Um, and so hopefully we'll have a lot fewer parking lots that need to be used as parking lots. Um, so I was, I was thinking more along the lines of um, purchasing parking lots that were previously used for cars. One of the things is, uh, there's another question here, Peter, uh, while Peter's walking up with the microphone. One of the things I, I thought of was the um, me. Uh, microgrids. We just came back from Greenbuild, and all of Greenbuild was powered by a microgrid, off-the-shelf component parts, rather inexpensive, and the microgrid was powered by photovoltaics. The other, the other thing is, 
What Doug, I, I comment on what Doug said about the city of Providence getting the benefit of what the city of Cranston did in terms of setting up the infrastructure for uh, renewables. It's the, the, there's a potential for cities and towns poaching on one another. And so maybe there could be some thought given to sort of a Rhode Island city and town renewable energy co-op where somehow there's, a, there's a, a sharing of the revenue, sharing of the energy. Obviously the host community would, would get, might get a larger share of it, but uh, it's something that w w we would maybe start thinking more holistically. You have a comment from the... Yeah, well, in, my, in my research I found there are uh, farmers co-ops for solar. There's one in the Midwest where a farmer can pay $750 for a panel and he gets credit for all the energy that panel creates. Now he can buy as many panels as he wants, can afford, or wants to pay for. And this goes on for 20, 25 years. So you centralize the site so you don't have farmers struggling to put up their own solar panel uh, projects. And one problem, one, uh, problem that's come up is the interconnection problem. They're, not, they're nowhere near feeders or substations. They don't have three phase, so they can't connect anyway if they could put up solar panels. This is the way for farmers to get together and produce and you know, get credit for producing power. My apology for making you wait. It's okay. Go ahead. Um, I'm Mary Baker, the director of the Environmental Studies Program here at Rhode Island College. And one of the things that I, I think is um, sort of interesting is I, I think if I'm understanding what Diana is saying is you're sort of talking about family use or a single use user um, plan for solar and that much of what what you're talking about is really community use. And so what are the, the differences in those two different levels of thinking about enacting solar? Because it seems to me the considerations must be quite different. Yep. I, what Doug's referring to is community solar, which Rhode Island does provide, not in the specific structure that he mentioned, but uh, um, I worked um, on, on a very, very large, one of the largest community solar providers in the country. Um, and in Colorado, they have that where you actually buy in, almost like a CS, a farm CSA, where you buy in, actually own the panels, the credits come to you. It's a very complex tax structure on that. But Rhode Island does have that situation where if your house, which most houses, as Chris said, you know, only 40% of the houses are out, you know, really can fit solar. When you look at, you know, towns, I live in Bristol. Uh, I lucked out with my house, but the big oak trees and the things that we like about our town are actually inherently you know, go against actually putting solar up. But a community solar project can be um, done cheaper, sited somewhere, and then everybody gets a piece of it. Then we get back to the question, where does that big solar project go? And we're, we're back to where we just started in the beginning of this conversation. But it is a good solution because a lot of the people are outside of that, that, that phase. I just like to, I think it's a really good point you bring up, but as you know, an individual business that put up a 5.7 kilowatt um, system, it might cost more than doing a big thing, but it has zero impact on our neighbors, zero impact on the land. It's gonna be a really good economic investment for us, far better than investing in the stock market, I would imagine, or any other. And so you can talk about costs from like a big perspective, but from any individual thinking about doing it, I think it's really worth checking into um, because one, you're you're doing a good thing for the planet, and you're also doing a good self for a good thing for your own economics. So I don't think the two, um, I don't think just because it's cheaper to do a big giant project somewhere should take away how amazing it is to do a small project on your own roof. And and to chime on, chime in on that from a planning perspective, when Coventry rewrote its solar ordinance uh, over the last couple of months. Um, whereas everybody else was sort of looking at solar systems on size and scale, uh, we went in a little bit of a different direction when it came to rooftops because there was, as controversial as solar has been, as renewables have been, there was no objection to mm. building stuff on people's rooftops. So we were able to simply say, anything you can put on a rooftop permitted by right no uh, must, no fuss coming, looking for uh, zoning or planning approval. So, uh, you know, that's one thing that we can do to try and drive solar development in a more palatable direction from a planning perspective. Well done, Brian, well done. 
Thank you, Brian. Um, that's exactly one of the things that was on my mind um, as a, both a planner and, and a land use lawyer, just, to, just as you. Um, I work with a number of communities in, in Rhode Island, uh, and I have for many years. Um, and while it appears that Cranston um, was responding to someone who came to them and they were ill prepared uh, in response to actually deal with solar uh, and in a manner that satisfies uh, both the public interest as, as well as the private interest and the um, utility investment. Um, and, and Coventry was also reacting and uh, tried to use the existing zoning and planning structure, I imagine, uh, in, in order to come to grips with some of these issues. And, and it sounds to me like uh, you're, you're now looking at things in, in a manner where your zoning, uh, could be your planning board and your zoning are taking into consideration the, the various interests. Um, I'd like to get back to a comment you made earlier and ask you directly, um, you know, because no matter where you put the solar panels, um, you're going to run into zoning. Um, what can we do if we wanted to get out, out in front of the issue um, and be um, an incentive, incentivize and accommodate the requests? Because I see this as an inevitable direction. Um, I was around when telecom first came in. Um, and then wind, and now it appears to be solar, and those things never really fit in with um, the with zoning as it has been developed. Um, it's co I, I consider those things sort of a hybrid between a utility and a use, um, not necessarily a commercial use, although I can see where that perspective comes from. So how do we get ahead of this? How, how, do, we, how do we get in a position? Uh, I'm in the position now where I'm being asked to, to write a solar ordinance for a community. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very interesting subject. Well, from a farmer's perspective, there's good farm fields and there's bad farm fields. So there's really good top quality soil and there's soil that's more marginal. And so if you're going to have to destroy a farm, think about the quality of the soils and what its potential would be. I mean, not that I'm advocating that, but you know, there is different qualitative difference. That's very good. Uh, I also think um, the Office of Energy Resources has been running a stakeholders group for the last couple of months. Um, and I've been participating that, in that and hearing from the developer's side of the perspective, um, it, it's really been highly educational um, in bringing all the various people together and I, I think open communications like that will help us learn where the shared common ground is. I mean, we just passed a new solar ordinance in August in Coventry, and after you know three months participating in this group, I'm already realizing we made some mistakes in putting that ordinance together in that uh, so much attention was focused on where we didn't want solar to be that we failed to open the doors and invite it into areas where we would prefer it to be. So I'm already trying to keep notes and, and devise amendments to that ordinance to try and draw the solar uh, into more of the built environment instead of the unbuilt environment. Uh, Brian, Coventry has some uh, big box stores. Um, uh, center of New England, yes. yes. Uh, how, how receptive are they to uh, PV, solar renewable PV panels on the roofs? Uh, well, I haven't really uh, ventured down that route at, at this point in time, but certainly it is a very common comment when dealing with the public. Uh, you know, we have uh, hundreds of acres of, of asphalt and rooftop at, at center of New England that a lot of people see uh, as potential solar development. But when you sit down and talk with developers, you learn about um, you know, issues like cost. Well, maybe we can get around that with some government incentives to, to sort of lower the cost of putting things in the built environment. Maybe we can uh, have some other government incentives to um, encourage the landowners of those properties to invite these sorts of uh, dual uses onto their properties. Um, and, and those are things I'd like to explore further as, as we move on with the issue. Well, somewhat, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, 
in, with all good intentions, perhaps the center of New England can be renamed the, the renewable center of New England if they went, went down that course and, and tr be a true center. Um, over here, Representative Handy. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Art Handy, um, uh, and I'm in Cranston, so uh, it's funny, I've had the, it's gotten a little bit personal on some of these things where I've really seen and fr been frustrated with those, some of those pieces. Um, it's funny though, here about Coventry, we were, I was just joking here saying, I bet they cut down a lot of trees to put the, the center of New England in, in place uh, as well. Actually, obviously. that was all gravel pits, so. All of it was, okay, <laughs> I know it was right next to a, um, a, um, a quarry or something like that though. Um, but uh, so I had a mix of comments and questions. One, I, it, it actually fit with what I think Paul was saying. Uh, no, I'm sorry, with, with what Brian was saying a minute ago. I, th I think that's one of the other things is look to where there's a need um, for power, uh, where there's going to be choke points down the road. I know, for instance, I know there was discussions a while back about Middletown's growth um, and, and really looking at, at, at the potential increase in cost to all ratepayers. For, for having, you know, adding in new substations or bigger substations. And uh, I'm always happy to throw National Grid under the bus, but, hmm. but, but in the end, they're, they're obviously, their motivation um, to a certain degree is to build those bigger pieces. They're getting a, a return on that investment. But for ratepayers, it makes a lot of sense to me to try to look to drive solar toward those spots. And in some cases, that means it will be some open space. Maybe it gets used, but maybe instead of having it be, well, the struggle I'm thinking about with, with uh, both Coventry and, and, and Cranston and, and the challenges with private land in that equation as well, I'm sure, um, I, don't, I don't recall, I believe that actually was town land for the wind turbines, but I'm not sure about the other pieces. Is that right? That was town land, wasn't it? Uh, two of the turbines are on town land. They're on the Pachilla Superfund site, uh, but the other eight are all on private pieces of property. Yeah, so you, you run into those challenges where, okay, well, if they're not going to put solar or wind on something, are they going to potentially use it for something else? And that's the prop challenge we're looking at with farms, too. I, I think, um, you know, one of the biggest fears a lot of us have is that, you know, those farmers are going to choose instead just to get subdivided out, and it's going to become a whole bunch of, of one or two acre homes, which are not great contributors to uh, a lot of things, let's say. Uh, let's put it that way, <laughs> both as a legislator and as a, a, a neighbor. But... Um, the, I, I think the, the so there's a mix of things to comment on there, what I was saying, but I, I and again, I, I, I work for a company that does renewables, uh, solar, and it mostly does rooftop, and still though, I know in the end, we've got to be realistic that, I, I absolutely agree with, with um, I can't remember your name, but, but um, with the farmer, she's saying that we need a rooftop, we do, but we also need to look at other options out there if we're going to get to our goals down the road, if we're going to get to the kind of renewable numbers we're going to need to hit, because unfortunately, there's only so many south and east west facing roofs out there. Um, and, you know, we don't want to have everybody going out clear cutting our neighborhoods to put down, cut down all the trees to be able to get our south facing roofs to be all nice and, and uh, sunny as well. Um, that one last piece to put out there for us all, and probably the finger can be pointed back to me and the legislature too, but we also restrict effectively how much roof space somebody can use. Your system, I think you just said was like 4.7K or maybe 5 point, or maybe it was 7.4. 5.7. 5.7. But, yeah. but what I was going to say was that you're, you're trying to get it to your usage, and that's really what we're restricted on in Rhode Island. But if I had a roof, if, if I've got a very small electric use, I've got a decent, I don't have a very big roof, but it's, south, it's all south facing, but I'm restricted on how much of it I can fill up because I basically we, I hit a, a wall on how much I can net meter, and yeah. the, the incentive pieces are restricted to 100%. Um, so I, I can't go beyond that number. So something else to, to think about in our equation about all this, because in fact, most of the roofs actually can't be used up no matter what. Yeah, two, or thank, two, two other quick things. Uh, one of the things you touched upon, Art. Uh, one of the arguments that usually city and town councils make for allowing photovoltaics on open space or you know, clear cutting you know, woodland down is that, well, if it, was, if it was built for residential, our schools will be overwhelmed and it'll burn the tax rate. Well, how many schools are really being built? You know, you could look at it the other way. Um, and the other thing is, um, it's interesting, but the town of West Warwick, I believe, has some renewable energy facilities in the town of Coventry. Do they not, Brian? Excuse me? Do, do, does not the town of West Warwick have renewable energy facilities cited in the town of Coventry? Or am I... Uh, I believe that they are getting some of the wind turbine yeah. uh, power. West Warwick is, is the off-taker for two of the turbines, yeah. two mm -hmm. or three. 
So I'm just pointing out where it's, it's really, it's, it's really cross-boundary. It's geospatial, it's not geopolitical. So um, we've been talking about solar. I know Brian started with a story of the wind turbines. And when I think about land disturbance and land use and renewable energy, I'm sorry that we have to discount wind. We've got, Rhode Island's got the offshore wind, um, but it seems once the turbines show up on the land, we can't overcome the public opposition to it. From a farmer's point of view, you can still farm the land with a wind, wind turbine on it. They are doing that all around the country. Um, so I just wondered if the panelists could comment a little bit about whether you think, as we look to the future, we have to give up on wind, or there are some things we could do to try to overcome public opposition to wind as part of the mix. Um, I can go into that, and, and I, I did have some notes on that and jump right off, off, off that. But on the wind side, wind has the same kind of general uh, issues that solar has as far as siting with interconnection. Um, but they're, they, at one point, they very, very much you know, uh, separate paths. In the case of wind, as you pointed out, they do not take up as much physical ground space, but then they have a lot of visual and noise issues that go with that. Um, on the other side, on the solar, it's benign, it's quiet, it's a quiet neighbor, but the footprint is much larger on that. So the wind does have something because of its height, it's going to be seen further, it's going to be, some people see it unsightly. Um, the driver, and this is my personal opinion in Rhode Island, the driver for, for, for wind is capacity, and that's how long, um, how much that turbine is going to be producing. It's kind of like saying my car could do 100 miles an hour, but it can only do it for they can only do it for a half an hour, so I'm only going to go 50 miles. The capacity is 50%. When you look at, I could use a case in point, the wind turbine in Portsmouth, which is actually has fairly decent capacity, which is 20 to 22%. Um, the offshore wind is 50%. And, and when you look out in North Dakota, in those areas, at 40% capacity in the upper 30s is literally huge capacity where the economics really work. So when you look at capacity, you start looking at really specific sites. They tend to be on the top of the hills, <laughs> you know, and they tend to be towards the water um, where the, the wind is broke. So that just creates the other, you know, um, sighting issues and visual issues that you have there. And it's, it's a very much a struggle. Thus, I, I do stay away from wind. Ken, is it okay that Jim Murphy from Rhode Island College I think we, has we a question? About six more minutes to a break. All right. Yeah, my question, um, we, we see the need for renewable energy, but as we see this need, are we actually looking at uh, trying to reduce our appetite for mm -hmm. energy? And if somebody can speak to uh, th that issue, and are, are we doing enough to make our buildings energy efficient at the same time as climbing on board with renewables? Panelists? Not to harp on our brand new 5.7 kilowatt system, <laughs> but when we put that in, we put in an on-demand electric hot water heater that's 100% efficient, and we put in an electric furnace that is 97% efficient. And as soon as we get our electric car, we'll be able to plug it into our um, panels and therefore use less. So, you know, there's, there's potential when people get this, if, for the few people who can get rooftop um, solar, that they will actually start reducing... Um, their consumption as they get more electric appliances and want to fit it all into what they already have. <laughs> so, Diana, you, you didn't buy like eight more televisions, 40 more, 40 more refrigerators, <laughs> because you, you're getting all this free energy? Um, or, that's going to happen eight years from now. Okay. <laughs> the hot tub. Yeah. <laughs> Ken, I'm going to ask a, a quick question. I was thinking about a historical perspective. So, traditionally, how we would cite power how we would go through easements, uh, you know, how we would, in essence, meet the needs of the municipalities on a traditional energy basis versus what we are doing today with renewables. Have we learned? Have we changed? Is it different with renewables? Is the technology different? And as I've been listening, I'm just wondering, A, is this purely a local government issue? Is EPA involved? Is it a national issue. It almost sounds as if we have a bit of too much government. 
in some of these discussions. So if you could address those two issues. I can actually talk on that. The, this issue is going across on, on, on several fronts and several, several states um, where renewables are being pushed. Um, I think it's a little bit more concentrated in New England because of our space. Um, and, you know, as I said, we do value land and it's New England and we like it to stay New England. So that kind of gets tough. When you go into areas, um, I just finished up a very large project down in South Carolina that was next to a prison that was 90 acres that no one really wanted to be next to, a very large prison. Um, you know, that's not a big issue for land. Good to see you there. got out of there. Okay. Yeah, now they have, you know, they have to get Good to see you back in Rhode Island. Island. They hit freedom at that point. Um, <laughs> you know, so South Carolina isn't dealing with that issue as much as we are, but it is. You know, Rhode Island is very small and it's very tough to wherever you can, wherever you can put solar on there. And it's really important, I think, that, you know, not only do we say where it can't go, but where it can go. I mean, we have only 26 towns here. We could put them all on one school bus. Um, and, you know, I'm watching every town do their own ordinance in a vacuum in some cases, and they don't realize they're shooting themselves in the foot a lot of times when I walk in. I go, it was one town we're doing a project, and I said, the way you just altered your, your, um, your, your, um, your ordinance is actually just, a, uh, had you put that in place when we started this other project on the, on the, the Brownfield, we wouldn't have been able to do it, and it's, been a, it's a model project. So a better that. approach is statewide? I think the towns should get together and actually and work with the OER to actually draft up a, 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 a skeleton of a framework of, of, of a plan. Now, every town wants to do their own thing and they can tweak it, but starting off with, you know, a, a structure that everybody is thinking about, because I, every town I've seen, there's a flaw in one of their ordinances that they didn't either realize, and it wasn't intentional. Um, and in some cases, they've eliminated canopies because of the height of the, pan, of the, height of the actual, um, uh, array. Part, see, part of that problem is that we're all stealing each other's ordinances. <laughs> yes. So you're doing it in a roundabout way. And therefore right? stealing each other's flaws at the same time. Yeah. Um, you know, nobody is is truly starting from scratch and working from the ground up. Yeah. I mean, when we redid our ordinance, the first thing the town council asked for is give us five ordinances from other communities that are similarly <laughs> situated to ours. Uh, and that was sort of what they used as their jumping off point and therefore also, you know, what they wanted to see in, in their ordinance. Yeah. Well, also governments are very reluctant to be the, uh, the first adopters or the, or, the, or the inventors of anything. They, they do want to see that and, and copy what others have done. Doug, you... Uh... Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see the state set minimum standards at, at least to apply to all the towns because that would force Cranston to at least to do something because Cranston came in with no thought whatsoever to any kind of special ordinance. They're just doing it by their normal land development procedures. I mean, the only reason we have a solar ordinance is because of work, the work I did with Steve Stikos. But enough of the planning, nothing would have been done. Doug, let me ask you this, because part of uh, Peter's question was, if it's a larger issue than just Rhode Island or the cities and towns, hmm. do, the, do the various land trusts in Rhode Island, in New England, talk to each other about this issue? We do in Rhode Island, the Rhode Island Land Trust Council. We get together every, every March and talk about the issues. So. so, Ken, I think we are going to go to a break. This is RNN. The Renewable Now Network, where sustainability makes sense.